Welcome back, everyone. Um, we are committed to keeping the trains running more or less on time. So pardon my role as the conductor. I, I just want to make sure that uh, everything runs smoothly. I'm Elon Berman. I'm the senior vice president of the American Foreign Policy Council. Um, I am here mostly in an efficient role uh, today. Uh, delighted to be here. I've, uh, my contributions to the, the Russia and the Middle East project were a little earlier where I did a paper uh, earlier this year on uh, Russian demography and Middle East policy. Um, that's not the subject here. The subject here is uh, the question of private military contractors and their role as a supplement, as a complement to Russia's warfighting strategy. Couldn't be timelier uh, in terms of a topic. Um, so I thought that uh, the best thing to do would be to sort of to lead with the folks who really know the subject inside and out. Um, so what I'm going to do is with very, very minor introductions, I'm going to turn the floor over first to Sergei Sukhankin uh, from the Jamestown Foundation, and then after him to my colleague Steve Blank from the American Foreign Policy Council, and then after him to uh, Ted Karasik of Gulf State Analytics um, to talk about uh, and unpack for us this enormously timely uh, subject uh, and uh, to add another layer of complexity to what we've heard already today. So with that, uh, formalities aside, gentlemen, feel free to sit at your seats and speak. And uh, off we go. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the Jamestown Foundation for bringing me uh, from the other side of the Atlantic uh, and uh, to be able to speak um, about this extremely sensitive topic. Uh, and the fact that this topic is super sensitive is uh, or was corroborated today with the assassination of three Russian journalists who are working, who have been working on the Wagner Group uh, in Central African Republic. Uh, so these uh, Russian journalists uh, keep getting killed, uh, those who are working on the Wagner Group. And I think this um, actually portrays, this shows uh, how sensitive and how um, essential this topic is for the Russian authority, for the Russian side. And my assignment today is to speak about uh, both theoretical and practical aspects uh, of uh, Russian PMCs operating primarily in Ukraine, but of course I will be making allusions uh, to some other theaters uh, too. Uh, and when saying private military companies, I will be primarily referring to the Wagner Group. Um, why? Well, because this is the most well-known company, uh, the one that uh, when it was destroyed uh, in Syria uh, and uh, well, some sources say 200 people were killed, uh, but my information said that it's uh, close to 300 persons actually that was uh, killed in Syria. Uh, and um, speaking in retrospect, I have to say that employment, uh, employment of private militarized group uh, and groups for achieving specific geopolitical and economic objectives uh, has been one of the um, an integral part, uh, an important tool of Russian way of foreign policy making uh, at different periods, both before 1917, during the Soviet period, uh, and after 1991. Even though the names varied, uh, they changed, they evolved, the essence, it was preserved, it stayed there. Uh, on the basis of my research published by the Jamestown Foundation entitled uh, Continuing War by Other Means, the case of Wagner, Russia's prime a uh, private military company in the Middle East. We can attribute the following functions uh, to the Russian PMCs, and here are three key functions that are performed, uh, that are carried out by Russian PMCs. First of all, it's uh, economic function, which is realized, which is conducted via the concept called power economy. Secondly, it's a geopolitical function, a uh, sort of promotion of Russian national interests abroad, which was underscored by President Vladimir Putin back then, uh, not president, in 2012, and a military strategic function uh, in a form of asymmetric response, uh, which was demonstrated uh, in many ways uh, uh, in uh, Syria and uh, beyond. And here are key points that I want to emphasize uh, here. First of all, Ukraine played uh, the role of a polygon as a testing ground uh, for the Russian PMCs. Uh, in fact, it was kind of a natural selection process in Crimea and the Donbass region. And the Wagner Group itself, it was born in Ukraine. Uh, and uh, um, um, if we allude, we refer to the year 2014 and um, to lesser perhaps extent 2015, we'll see that 
the Wagner Group and its predecessor, uh, the Slavonic Corps Limited, it played uh, mainly auxiliary function, auxiliary role. Uh, when the role of uh, the, when the quality of personnel uh, was not that high, and uh, the most interesting thing here is that the Cossacks actually comprised a sizable part uh, of this group. Point number two. Uh, Russian PMCs are in fact PMAs, private military armies, uh, because if we take a look at how uh, Russian PMCs uh, have been operating, especially in Syria, especially starting from 2015 and 2016, uh, we will see that they are capable uh, sometimes of performing military operations of uh, relatively high uh, sophistication. Uh, Sometimes they also were said to have formed a vanguard of uh, certain offensive operations. And this sharply contradicts uh, with how private military companies, Western power, uh, private military companies, how they operate. Point number three, uh, the control and command structure of uh, Russian PMCs and the Wagner Group in particular, it uh, in many ways resembles uh, patterns established in uh, the regular armed forces. And there is a huge room for research, for additional research and for speculations, uh, but at the same time there are a lot of obstacles uh, for uh, the researchers, for those who want to uh, get under the skin of this phenomenon because uh, not much information is um, available unfortunately here. And the point number five, uh, four, I think the most interesting, the most intriguing point, uh, which boils down to a single question. Who owns the Wagner Group? And there are two explanations. The, the first one, one explanation, is the most convenient one uh, and the least challenging one. Uh, the majority of Russian Western sources uh, attribute uh, the Wagner activities of the Wagner Group to uh, Yevgeny, uh, so-called Putin's chief, uh, Prigozhin. Uh, and the second explanation, which requires more effort, intellectual effort, and more investigations, um, from my perspective, I think there is a consortium of actors that uh, actually have control uh, over the Wagner Group and other PMCs that are currently active uh, abroad. Here are just a couple of uh, couple of examples. Well, first of all, we take uh, at the training process of the Wagner Group, we'll see that uh, it is based, uh, it is uh, trained at uh, Molkina Polygon, which is Krasnodar Krai, uh, which belongs to the GRU, 10th Special Forces Brigade, and major construction works were done by the Russian Ministry of Defense, and uh, uh, it's quite uh, difficult to imagine that a single tycoon, not even an oligarch, uh, has this opportunity, has been given this room for maneuver. Uh, and the second example is uh, the notable a uh, bill that was actually failed by the State Doom on March 27, 2018, uh, when all major Russian internal forces, including all the Siloviki, they were actually bitterly against legalization of private military companies in Russia. And that got me thinking, why was that? So even though uh, Lavrov and Putin before that uh, and uh, uh, Shamanov, many of them were saying that yes, private military companies should be legalized, but then uh, after that, uh, everyone was virtually against this uh, motion, this decision. And uh, some conclusive remarks. So life after death, or why Russia needs Wagner and similar structures, uh, who needs them? Well, first of all, here appears uh, on the surface is the concept, uh, the plausible deniability, conf uh, uh, deniability, plausible deniability concept. Everyone basically is satisfied with these structures. The government can solve its uh, issues without any soldiers uh, involved. Uh, private interests of certain uh, factions or some individuals uh, are also followed. Uh, and there is no public discontent in Russia. If you take a look at Russia's reaction on uh, the decimation of the Wagner group, well, many Russians are saying, well, they had it coming. They knew why they were in Syria. And, uh, well, they are mercenaries. As Mr. Grachov said uh, during the first uh, storm of Grozny, when he said about Russian soldiers from Kantimirovsky division, well, those are soldiers, those are mercenaries. We don't know them. Uh, and secondly, um, 
the never-ending pool of recruits. So the, the, this triangle between the quality, quantity, and the price, uh, it is here, it is there. Uh, Russian lives, lives of Russian mercenaries are cheaper than uh, those from, uh, from other countries. Uh, the quality is quite high, the quality is quite high. Uh, and the quantity, well, there is a lot of middle-aged men in Russia with uh, uh, sort of enough uh, military background uh, who are able and most importantly willing to die uh, for uh, sort of either Russian national interests or for their pecuniary interests. Uh, and there is a never-ending pool of resources. And finally, uh, the final point, uh, the duality of functions. If we read carefully um, Gerasimov and, for example, uh, Konstantin Sivkov, we will see that uh, the Russian military theory, actually, it envisages uh, something uh, quite more sophisticated, something far-reaching uh, than is on the surface. Uh, the Russian military theory sees private military companies in two main functions. First of all, in a form of irregular forces of defense, uh, something uh, in the form of territorial defense units, something that we can actually see in Kaliningrad Oblast with uh, the local Cossacks playing this role, those who return from Syria. And secondly, the active irregular force uh, as groups uh, capable of performing uh, certain military missions abroad. Uh, and this duality of functions, uh, plus of course the uh, uh, economic functions. Uh, this is what will uh, not put a lid on this uh, enterprise, uh, on this type of uh, companies in Russia. Hope I'm in clear. All right, thank you, Sergey. Steve? Thank you. Uh, the phenomenon of private military companies is, as Sergey said, ubiquitous. I want to build on what Sergey and General Gorinch said about Russian national security strategy, because the PMCs are a phenomenon that is intrinsic to Russian national security strategy writ large, not just Syria, not even just Africa. First of all, as we've pointed out in the Middle East today, the, uh, the presence of the Russians and the success of the Russians has not only emboldened Russia to go into Africa, it has enabled them to find, as I, uh, Ted and I call them enablers, like the UAE, which makes no bones about it, that are helping them get into Africa and use UAEs for purposes of getting access to mineral resources or energy contracts, or creating long-term lasting political influence and creating a basis as well for Russian arms sales to African countries, which is a big deal and a growing of growing importance. As Lavrov said before the BRICS, uh, Africa is of uh, growing importance to uh, the foreign ministry. It's of growing importance to other sectors as well. The phenomenon of private entrepreneurs, or quote private entrepreneurs, because they're not private, that's for sure, uh, in Russian policy goes back to the czars who used to use people uh, because it gave them plausible deniability. It also relieved the stress on the state budget. They don't have to pay for it. The private entrepreneur pays for it and does this. But it's become ubiquitous on the Putin. Think about this. There was an article in the Washington Post last week that one of the people who was sponsoring Maria Butina in her uh, quest for influence throughout Washington was another Russian oligarch billionaire or millionaire, as the case may be. We now find out that Russian millionaire or Greek millionaire with Russian connections was bankrolling the uh, attempted coup in Macedonia and Greece that was uncovered about a week or 10 days ago, leading to the expulsion of two diplomats. Montenegro, Konstantin Malofiev, the same guy who organized private militias, that's what they were called then, for uh, Crimea and the Donbass, was involved in the Montenegro coup, which is about a year and a half ago. Other businessmen presumably are involved one way or another in financing these kinds of what you might call gray area phenomena or you know, under the radar military operations, but they are military operations. They are part of a broader national security strategy to upend the West, unhinge Western societies, and advance Russian national interests. At the same time, there are thousands of men, and I wrote about this eight or 10 years ago and more since, involved in various paramilitary groups as well as those who were consolidated two years ago into the Nazionalnaya Gvardia, the National Guard, uh, to defend the state. And they are outside the regular chain of command. They belong to Putin, as does the state, like a good, as, uh, un, as a Russian czar would, would see it. The state is his, uh, to use the old Russian term, vochina, uh, which uh, he can use uh, as he sees fit. 
and they've created these private militaries who are loyal to the state, who are also there to make money for their bosses and for the state. The uh, operation in Syria, for example, was aiming at a refinery, which obviously somebody in Moscow had major interests in. So this is a complex phenomenon, which is part of the larger Russian national security strategy of nonlinear, fifth generation, hybrid, whatever you want to call it, war. It is not a one off and out. These private entrepreneurs, quote unquote, are usable for all kinds of operations in and out of Russia to advance government interests, and they are ubiquitous. Now, to some degree, obviously, the phenomenon is an emulation of companies like Blackstock, uh, Blackstone in, in uh, Iraq, but Blackstone was mainly involved in logistics. These guys are actually doing combat ops as well as attempting to uh, coups and other black operations that you might find. They are therefore an ideal instrument for trying to stay under the radar or under the Article 5 rubric while creating havoc wherever they go, whether they do so by political means, as was the case with Butina, and as uh, we've seen in uh, Macedonia and Montenegro, or in actual combat operations, as is the case in Syria and in the Central African Republic. And the CAR is probably not the only place in Africa where they are located. And I would urge people, take a look at Africa, because everything we've seen in the Middle East is coming in Africa. They're there already. I have an article coming out that talks about this. But you're seeing growing Russian influence as well as, of course, the enormous Chinese influence. Finally, Latin America. Right now, it's quiet. We have, however, two states that are on the verge of failing, Venezuela and Nicaragua. Venezuela is going to hit a million percent inflation, if you can imagine that, something like Weimar Germany in 1923. Nicaragua has a uh, major uh, political strife going on. Russian military and quasi-military forces have been involved there for years. And Russia has used Venezuela and Nicaragua not only as bases for training and soldiers, but also to destabilize neighbors. And they've used private military contractors. I wrote about this nine years ago, and I'm going to conclude with this point because it's as relevant now as it is then. Victor Boot, you all remember the name, the arms dealer, a private entrepreneur, sitting in Moscow, even though Interpol wants him, is, goes out of his secure perch in Moscow to Bangkok to deal with DEA agents to run weapons to Colombia and then gets arrested in a sting. Now, he was sent. He didn't just pick up and get his passport and get on a plane. He was sent because the minute he was arrested, the whole Russian government went crazy trying to get him extradited, just as they are now trying to get Madame Butina ex extradited. He was sent, I would suggest, by Putin, Sechin, who has the portfolio, who's the curator, if you like, of Latin America, and Patrushev, in order to undermine the U.S. by running guns from, Venezuela, from Moscow to Venezuela to Colombia. We have Chavez on tape bragging about how he can do this. This is a perfect example. It took place in Latin America. It could happen again if a situation warrants that in uh, Latin America. And as I suggested, there are places of dry timber which are about to start burning very quickly. And therefore, everybody here needs to think about these groups, not just as an adjunct to Russian strategy in Syria or Ukraine, but as a global instrument of Russian power. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to take both of these uh, presentations and then kind of flip things on their head a little bit here. Uh, what I wanted to do for the next 10 minutes or so is talk about the evolution of PMCs in the Middle East region and how that fits into what's happening with Russia's PMC push today. There are three different types of PMC models that you find in the Middle East and particularly in the Gulf itself, and this has occurred over time. And I think this really began to start, at least from in the Middle East context, with the transfer of equipment and other materials from the Iraq theater to the Afghan theater. And in that period, uh, DOD, DOS, and other entities were renting out airplanes and other companies and cargo carriers and so on to move equipment from the Iraq theater via UAE to Afghanistan. Many Russian companies, for example, Dnepr, uh, sorry, uh, Dnepr Volga Airlines, for example, was hired by DOS to move 
or DOD, DOS, to move equipment from Iraq via UAE to Afghanistan. There are dozens of these kinds of companies that uh, the U.S. and its allies hired during this move. This was an example of how these types of companies got started in the region. A second type of uh, PMC that you find in the region are those that were involved in the campaign to counter piracy off the coast of Somalia. You had hundreds of PMCs, literally businessmen coming in, but, but businessmen who had state interests behind them too, because they wanted to get a piece of that PMC pie and what it meant to be a part of the PMC community within and around the Horn of Africa, as well as in and around the Strait of Hormuz itself. And we can see today how those maritime sea lanes, of course, are heating up again today. And that means that PMCs are likely to return. Uh, the third part here is has to do, and I'm going to use this very loosely, is with the groups of, of R2 or Academy, without mentioning the original company. These types of groups, these US-based, if you will, PMCs that fight in region are the third model that are used and are hired by Arab governments, and not only for their own special operations, but also for specific mission topics, as well as also for protection of the elites. So these three different type of PMC models over time have become uh, ingrained in the region. And now you have the Russians coming in with a multitude of different types of PMCs, uh, particularly with Wagner. And the question becomes about nexus. The nexus between this type of PMC development in the Gulf, in the Middle East, and that, uh, and that is owned by Arab states, versus those that are owned by Russians and oligarchs. In these third areas, such as in Africa or in Libya, and maybe somewhere else, will we see in the future a nexus of the PMCs? or are we going to see them fight against each other? And I wanted to bring up this point during this panel because this is all about Russian PMCs and so on, but there are Arab-based PMCs and then there are PMCs that America and its allies deal with in the region. So where are we heading in the next five years in terms of PMC nexus in terms of these conflicts? Thank you very much. Gentlemen, thank you. That's, uh, I, I think, a, a great, uh, great uh, appetite uh, generator for a, a very rich conversation. Um, what I was struck by, and let me uh, abuse my uh, post as moderator to ask the first question or, or some, some sort of hybrid form of comment and question, but what struck me uh, in listening to all three of you was how much this is not driven by real world constraints, right? There's very little conversation here about this being a product of necessity uh, in terms of uh, the Russian defense budget. Uh, very little conversation about uh, constraints on the Russian government that very naturally nudge them into the greater use of PMCs. Instead, what we're hearing is that PMCs are increasingly ubiquitous because they're effective, uh, because they work, and because they provide plausible deniability. So. Here's the question, uh, and Steve, you alluded to this, uh, at least in part in your comments. Is this the new normal? Is this what we're looking at in terms of Russian irregular warfare? Uh, certainly, we've seen flashes of it uh, in the context of the Ukraine theater. We've even seen flashes of it, although, as Sergey points out in his paper, less effectively uh, in Syria. Uh, but where do we go from here? Uh, what, what does the complexion of Russia's uh, PMC footprint globally look like in the years ahead? Uh, let me start. I, I think it is part of the new normal, at least for the foreseeable future. Uh, it's a technique that Putin, as I said, has used all over the world. He's used it here, albeit in a nonviolent way. He's used it in Macedonia, Negra, uh, Ukraine, Central African Republic, Syria, Mozambique. Mm -hmm. You can see it elsewhere. They try to do something like that in Latin America, as I said, with Victor Booth uh, as the arms salesman. So, yes, 
It's a flexible model. It can be used elsewhere. And not only is it plausible to deny, but it's cheap. The Russian government doesn't have to pay for it. These, on, these oligarchs, out of their own, uh, bankroll these groups out of their own money in the expectation of making fabulous rewards afterwards. Or host governments will charge. And I'm, if, I'm sure, for example, in Africa that these people do, you know, are not coming there being paid for it strictly by Russia, but host governments are paying at least some of their expenses, and there's the expectation of major rewards given raw material, diamonds, mines, whatever. So I do think it's the new normal. But I also, because uh, I just didn't have the time for it in the presentation, want to warn people. The classical definition of the state, Max Weber, is that institution which has a monopoly of the use of legal force in the country. When you start devolving force to private armies, so we have Gazprom has a private army, for example. And there are other such form formations in Russia. You are throwing loaded dice onto the table. Because at some point in time, if the state does become weak, those forces don't go away, but they're owned by somebody who is not completely controllable by an enfeebled state. And we can see some really nasty phenomena as a result. The same is true in any other state, or you know, if these people are there, where mercenaries can turn on their masters. That's been known to happen as well. So yes, it's the new normal. It's a form of, if you like, irregular. I don't like the term hybrid war, but we'll use it. Uh, new generation, whatever. It's a form of war in our time, which allows you to stay under the Article 5 or force majeure category and has the potential for substantial, if not enormous, payoffs. But it also carries some real and consequential risks. Uh, Ted, do you want to weigh in, or do we want to open it up for other questions? Yeah, I think we can open Okay, uh, we have uh, some microphones coming around. Uh, please raise your hands and they'll make their way to you as soon as they can. Uh, let's, let's do, sir, you had your hand up first. Uh, sir, right there. <laughs> you, you can take them both. <laughs> I get two questions that way. Uh, Mike Ryan at the uh, Jamestown Foundation. It, this seems like a very obvious question but you know, one of the, th the, the functions that you didn't emphasize or maybe mention even uh, that the PMCs could serve is intelligence functions. Uh, and uh, obviously they have to have their own intelligence you know, to operate, so there must be some intelligence collection. But is there any function of intelligence collection or operations that can be traced back or th either theoretically traced or really traced back to, uh, to normal uh, uh, if there's such a thing, intelligence channels inside Russia. You know, they don't talk about intelligence collection and operations in public, so you, it, you can only infer it. But the ubiquity of this formation and the fact that it's carried out in conjunction with elements of the GRU, Butina, for example, uh, Montenegro, Ukraine, Middle East, suggests that this is being coordinated at a very high level with Russian intelligence operations, and they probably have taskings. You know, again, what those taskings are, we can't know, and if we did, we couldn't talk about it here. But I have no doubt in my mind that that's you know, for a given part of the equation. Okay, do you agree? Uh, yeah, I think I would agree, and uh, I would allude here to a. Uh, uh, remark from General Leonid Ivashov, who was asked about the Patriot private military company uh, and whether it is operating in Syria or not. Uh, and the journalist asked him whether uh, this private military company belongs uh, to the or is controlled in any form by the uh, Ministry of Defense. And he said that uh, those guys, the Ministry of Defense, they have the, their own uh, forces uh, to do uh, the functions that are attributed to this PMC. And, and I would agree with uh, Stephen here. I think uh, that uh, the intelligence collection could be done by other uh, branches, by other departments in Russian architecture. Uh, the Molkina, you mean, the Molkina facilities uh, was quite interesting because it belongs to the GRU, uh, GRU. Uh, and uh, the major construction works were done by the Russian Ministry of Defense uh, and the training procedures, uh, how, the, how they are trained, how they have been trained, uh, it in many ways uh, resembles 
uh, trainings that are undergo uh, underwent by uh, Russian uh, special military uh, services uh, and special military forces. Uh, can you hear me? I was saying about the Patriot Company as an example. I'm not saying I'm not talking about the Wagner Group now. Uh, I was just saying about their preparation, their training, which in many ways uh, resembles uh, preparation that is uh, underwent, uh, undergone by Russian uh, special military forces. And this is uh, what is quite interesting about this group and about this uh, the entire project. Other questions? Uh, let's go. Let's do one right there, sir, in the back. Yes. Thank you. I present myself. I'm Bruce Matesso, intern at Fort for Peace. My question is to Mr. Stephen Blanc. Uh, at your opinion, what's the real influence Russian, it Republic, Republican, South African, and uh, what's the, pres the Russian presence at uh, Djibouti? The first question? What's the real influence Russian in a Republican South African? Oh, uh, what is uh, Russian influence in South Africa and what is the Russian presence in Djibouti? Yeah, Republican South African. Yeah. In Djibouti, oh, in Djibouti uh, I th they're part of the uh, International Naval Flotilla that is conducting anti-pirate operations under, I think, a UN mandate. Uh, there's, uh, many governments have uh, naval forces out there and they're working to uh, clear the Gulf of Aden and the uh, Indian Ocean of uh, uh, pirates. Uh, and that's an internationally recognized mandate. I haven't seen any real evidence of what they're doing in Djibouti. I, the, the Americans are there and the Chinese are there, and those are the two biggest uh, participants. In South Africa, uh, as you know, the BRICS meeting just finished in South Africa last week. They have a lot of economic influence. They're trying to gain more. They're trying to sell them uh, 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 nuclear power uh, through Rosatom. They have economic deals. There's probably a lot of mining and diamond operations going on involving Russian corporations as well. South Africa and Russia are very friendly. Uh, I would not be surprised if there are operations, uh, commercial operations going on that nobody really wants to talk about in public, given uh, what we know about the previous government of South Africa and uh, uh, the Russian government. Mr. Zuma has a well-earned reputation for corruption. And uh, they are probably using Af South Africa as well as a base for other diplomatic, political, and maybe even military intelligence operations throughout Southern Africa. Uh, what is very clear is that Africa is an expanding area for the Russian military, foreign, and business foreign affairs and business communities. Mozambique, Angola, Rwanda, South Africa, obviously, and so on. And the traditional uh, means of influence are in the mining, energy, and including nuclear energy, arms sales, and obviously now the use of mercenaries to provide various kinds of military uh, support and presumably intelligence. Uh, and as a result, Russia then can come in and say, as they're doing in the Central African Republic, they're they're ready to help mediate civil wars. Well, of course, that's putting the wolf in the uh, chicken coop, uh, but uh, you know that's the way it is. Can I just add? I think what uh, I think you meant to say Burundi, because there is a tie between Russian uh, PMCs and Burundi, which is established uh, Russian military uh, private military company uh, Patriot is currently. Uh, making a physical protection of a uh, Russian military base that is said to be constructed in Burundi. Uh, I read about this one. Uh, and I would also add to what uh, Stephen said uh, about the arms sales and military experience. Uh, also, uh, military instructors, the Russian PMC, members of PMCs, they could act as uh, military instructors uh, because of the local uh, militant, the local army, they lack this experience. And in this regard, uh, members of PMCs can act as uh, the military advisor during the Soviet period. So this is the identical function. I'd just like to add to this question about the Horn of Africa. I think it's very important now clearly to watch out the Russian-Ethiopian uh, relationship. 
I think because of the agreement that was signed between Ethiopia and Eritrea just recently that was brought together by the UAE with a $3 billion investment into Ethiopia is part of a larger move uh, for allowing Russia into that part uh, of Africa. Uh, in addition to that, you're seeing Ethiopia uh, get closer to Moscow because on religious grounds, which is a which is part of the expanding tactic from the Christian Middle East. And uh, therefore, because of Ethiopia's riches and the strategy in which to extract goods from that country out through Eritrea, I think that we're going to be seeing a lot of P uh, Russian PMCs popping up there, too. So since we're right there, let's uh, go just uh, one seat down right there, ma'am. Hi, thanks so much for um, speaking today. It's been really illuminating. Um, I just have a quick question. Uh, with the tools that we have available and knowing that we're um, supposed to be working you know, within international law and that um, these uh, companies walk outside of that in this sort of gray zone, um, what recommendations would you have for the West to combat this threat using the tools that we have available? First of all, the threat is not primarily military. The threat is, is fundamentally political. So really, we need to strengthen the economic and political capabilities of these states to deal with the problems they have so that the conflicts don't erupt in them or between them, which is what provides Russia with opportunities. Russia doesn't really uh, cr create opportunities as much as it exploits them, as we've talked about and others have written. So the, also, there has to be much more serious attention paid, I think, to Latin America uh, and, and to Africa. I mean, about Latin America, you know, we make a, we're, we're, screaming, we, uh, we're screaming a lot about immigration from Latin America. Venezuela has already ha had a million and a half people flee the country because it, it's just intolerable. Nicaragua is on the verge of becoming a failing state. These are not problems that are going to be confined to their borders. And what's more, Moscow and perhaps Beijing will try to take advantage of them. In Africa, I, the only thing I see about American foreign policy, and for that matter, European foreign policy in Africa, is either there's some big investments from the Europeans or in American foreign policy. Now and then we mention Africa in conjunction with you know, the uh, uh, initiatives against AIDS, which are wonderful and critical and so forth. But it's hardly enough to say there's a strategy or foreign policy for this. AFRICOM's budget has been cut. Uh, uh, we need to have a real rethinking of the foreign threat to Africa. And it, no matter what Russia's doing, China's doing even much more. And I, this has been known for a decade. And one of the reasons the Russians are getting in is probably because they don't want China to have the whole continent to themselves. But Africa remains really a black hole in American foreign policy. And, it's, and for that matter, in the Middle East, too, I don't think we're cognizant of what uh, the strategic transformations that are going on uh, there entail and are fully up to speed on how to deal with them. Uh, my comment uh, to your question is, is that basically, I think this is an analogy of how American or Western forces use and the Russians have a completely different set of ROEs. And the same thing is true in the PMC world. PMC world for Russia there are no ROEs per se, whereas for PMCs that are operating in the Gulf, they're forced to pay attention to particular rules of engagement, particularly in terms of their conduct and what weapons they have on board. When they come to shore, they got to leave their weapons outside of international boundaries 12 miles, so there's storage facilities outside of these ports and around the Gulf. So there's rules and regulations governing PMC for those that are from the West and have been involved in counter piracy operations and so on. So the two sides do not mix together at all. And that's the fundamental problem here. Very good. We have time for one more question. Let's, uh, let's go up here, ma'am. Um, let's wait for the microphone. Thanks. Thanks for your my presentation. My name is Li Yang. I just want to know, or clarification, whether this PMC 
is a little bit different, the same as a private contractor in the United States by the United States government, whether that is a military like Blackwaters or some other private contractors, and whether they have been abused their power, not just within their their contract, but they may be used the abuse of government authorities. And uh, I think we have the uh, Russians. Let's just do one question. We have Russian cyber attack and meddling. I just wonder if Putin says this is not by Russian government, so is it possible by their private contractors? I've seen no evidence that the Russian private military companies are engaged in cyber activities, although they probably have some cyber capability. It's not clear what that might be, but they probably have some. Uh, what you have to understand is that the Russian approach to war, the contemporary war, is a whole-of-state operation using all the instruments of the dime and creating or innovating new ones or adapting ones used in the West, as Ted said, which has specific rules and regulations, but that are adapted for Russian military uh, use. So they operate under a completely different paradigm. 